Translated as Mountain of Gold, the name given to the community of Mount Dor alludes to its French influence due to the 1783 Royal Cedula of Population. Under this cedula, the island of Trinidad saw an influx of French colonists, free black people, and African slaves into the then Spanish-governed colony. An initiative that was the brainchild of the Grenadian-born Philippe Hors Rome de Saint-Laurent, the cedula of population resulted in the growth of island dwellers from under 3,000 in 1783 to 18,627 in 1797. It resulted in the growth of many French-named villages and towns scattered throughout the island, such as Carinage, Lopino, Lavantil, Bouc Malatras, Petit Bouc, and Chamfleur. A community within Chamfleur, Mount Dor, similar to other French settled communities, was predominantly Catholic and followed a plantation based model. The approximately 1.65 km stretch that is the Mount Dor Road was once home to cocoa plantations and cashew fields of its settlers. As the time passed by, the economic mainstay of Mount Dor and Chamfleur would switch from agriculture to industry, evident in the many factories in operation today. Many of the agricultural plots would convert to building plots for many homes as well. It is against this backdrop that the young ministerial intern, Pastor T. A. Sanderson, began his ministerial work. In 1967, there was no established Seventh-day Adventist church in the area. There were, however, some families that had come to hear of the Advent message as a result of the 1966 and 1967 Port of Spain Crusades held by George Rainey and E. E. Cleveland. Some of these early Adventist families were the Alleens, the Barons, the Estridges, and the Fagaros. Carly Scobie, an intern minister from the crusade that worked the area, would visit often with these families. Later on in the same year, the young intern pastor T. A. Sanderson started his ministry in Mount Dor by having regular studies with the Grandison and Williams families. It is at one of these study sessions at the Williams's home that Sanderson expressed an interest in holding a crusade. Following the advice of Mr. Williams, Pastor Sanderson, along with Oswald Taylor, asked Brother Wellington Franklin to open up his spacious home to host the evangelistic series. His consent ushered in the humble beginnings of what we formally now know as the Mount Dor Seventh-day Adventist Church. The 23 new souls yielded from that crusade helped to form part of the fledgling church membership. Some of the new believers were Iola Williams, Evelyn and Marilyn Barron, Earl Aline, Mary Simmons, Catherine Thomas, Hentieta John, Ingrid Crookshank, Monica Rochard, Albertha Agard, and many others. In the spirit of support toward this up and coming church, members from the neighboring Curep and San Juan SD churches would pitch in to help nurture and worship with the new believers. Brother Joy Bonaparte and Paul Philip 
would serve as elders. Clarestine Grant as the treasurer. Violet Carrington as church clerk. And Edward Henry as the youth leader. The young church was energetic, full of life. The church was equipped with individuals eager to serve. In spite of a willingness to serve and vibrancy of services, the young church would soon see a problem looming over the horizon. Expansion This became the greatest need of the young church. As the fervor increased the membership of the church boomed until scouts were sent in search of an alternative site. With ardent prayers and diligent searching, Joseph McCoon and Wainwright Philip found a location owned by Dipnarain Maharaj and an agreement of purchase was made on the 16th of September 1973. The church site, which was previously used as an automobile garage and mechanic shop, had a galvanized shed which would serve as the church's meeting house. In 1975, the church moved from Fourth Drive to its new site and began its building program. The architectural drawings were done free of charge by John Yearwood, a member of the San Juan Estia Church. The layout of the building, the concept and design of the basement, the functional design of the choir loft and baptistry were directed by Texaco engineer Brother Wellington Franklin. The formwork of the arches were prepared by woodworker Orville Tobias. The head welder in the building process was Oswald Taylor, who also supervised the efforts of other welders such as Dylan Monroe and Dexter Bristol. Michael Phillip worked on all phases of the building from foundation to finish. His financial contributions helped to facilitate the building project. Glenroy Roberts supervised the construction of the drain on the western side of the building, the internal wall partitions, and the electrical works with Mr. Price from South Trinidad. For 17 years, the Mount Dor Estate Church remained under construction. This was 17 years of sacrificial giving of time talent and treasures of young and old alike. It was dedicated on June 21, 1992 and its cornerstone laid by the then South Caribbean Conference President, Pastor Errol Mitchell. As the years rolled on, members would continue to contribute to the building and design of the church. Emmanuel Aline would spearhead the casting of the churchyard, the stone walls of the church perimeter, and the internal floor of the church in the 90s. Michael Philip would secure the services of a glass specialist and swap the original concrete vent blocks out for stained glass windows in the 2000s. During his tenure as building chairman, Brother Errol Henry would source the cedar trees that replaced the evangelical benches. He would oversee the erection of the children's department partitions, construct the eastern facing utility annex and install the air conditioning units as well as upgrade the electrical system. 
Building Committee Chair and Co-Chair Alethea McIntyre and Jemima Rhea Baron de Freitas would oversee the construction of the back retaining wall in 2015. Led by the spirit, Pamela McCoon and Alan Ross made tangible contributions to the church. Whether the contributions made were tangible, incognito, or in service to the various departments, the spirit of giving continues up to this day. From the 50 years since its inception to now, the Mount SD Church membership has grown from its 23 odd members to 452 members according to local church records. The South Caribbean Conference records reflect 660. The spirit of the church has continued to grow and the atmosphere of the church has diversified over the years. Now, worship services are technologically abled through the use of projectors and an audio-visual department headed by Len Young with the assistance of several youth technicians. No longer is the piano the sole instrument that accompanies song services. Nowadays, the music department, led by Mark Haru, also includes violins, flutes, guitars, the steel pan, the trumpet, and drums, whose players willingly volunteer their time and talents each Sabbath. The Mount Daw Steel Orchestra now frequently plays musical renditions during Sabbath services. A band which saw its humble origins and was the brainchild of Alan Samuel in the mid-90s, today has expanded its leadership to include Ashton George and Anthony King who willingly give of their time and talent. The Children's Division, now spearheaded by Jenny's Passy and previously under Barbara Withers, continues to spiritually nurture the babes of the church and has successfully held vacation Bible school programs for the church and community's children. The Adventist Youth Department, now led by Johan Passy, still holds regular Sabbath afternoon programs, plans camps and other activities for the youth of the church. The Community Services Department still actively aims to bring relief to those in need. Its most recent project being the rebuilding of a member's home, one that was spearheaded under the late Anne Thomas in 2015 and one which is nearing completion. Community guest days, senior citizens' luncheons, home visits and market days are just a few of the many initiatives put on by this department. Of the 20 pastors that ministered to the Mount Dawes Seventh-day Adventist Church, Pastor J.T. Carrington was the first pastor and pioneer of the church. Pastor H. L. Gabriel was the one who finalized the purchase of the land with Mr. Dipnarain Maharaj on our behalf. Pastor Raul Rowley began the building approval process with the Town and Country and Fire Services Department. Pastor Owen Scott unified the districts under his leadership and is affectionately remembered by those he served. Pastor T. A. Sanderson holds the honor as speaker for the first crusade that provided the first group of believers.
Pastor Cyril Clements made his mark with biblical greeting of Shalom. Pastor Clyde Lewis's impact was his powerful interactions with the youth. Pastor Keith Triggs will be remembered for his engaging preaching style. Pastor William Cunningham is lovable, talkative and a historian in his own right. Pastor Owen Jack has served Mount Daw for the longest at seven years. Pastor Sam Lao Singh's dream was to make Mount Daw the gem of the corridor as he liked to say. Under the tenure of the current pastor Steve Riley, the church delved into a locally unprecedented style of evangelism, internet-based programming with the aim of spreading God's truth throughout the world in 2012, 2013, and 2016. The church would become a broadcast center and host site which disseminated nightly messages throughout the country, the Caribbean region, and the world. The church saw an increase in its membership through newly baptized members and was blessed by this ministry. Over the period of these last 50 years, many individuals have volunteered their time, talents, and resources to the furtherance of the Lord's work. Many now rest awaiting the second coming of our Saviour Jesus Christ, having passed on the baton of leadership, responsibility and service to those who are living, to the able-bodied, to the youth. So as we remember our pioneers, the physical strength of Deacon Henry Allen, the dramatic experiences of Brother James Thomas, the faithfulness of Roy Ezreal Blackwell, the skill of Gurney Victor, the endurance of Maurice Victor, the talents of Wellington Franklin, the community work of Elva Philip, Maudry Aline and Anne Thomas, the nurturing spirit of Ivy Jones, the meekness of Claristine Grant and the resoluteness of Edward Henry, let us as a church continue fulfilling our mission of proclaiming the three angels' message of Revelation 14. Bearing in mind our humble beginning where the church is today under God's leading, we face the future with hope, a hope that will fulfill its mission hear the well done from Jesus himself and enter the city that God has built for those who love him. <laughs>